Hello and welcome back to the Maker Jane channel where I share all things English paper piecing from tips and tutorials to projects and more. So if you love EPP like I do, please consider subscribing. My name is Janie and in this video I'm doing an update of what I've been up to here at Maker Jane as well as some of the personal projects that I've been working on during the month of February. I really enjoy sharing these update videos because I enjoy watching update videos from some of my favorite quilters as well. I love being inspired and seeing the projects that they're working on and it just kind of helps ignite creativity in me. So I thought I would share that with you and share with you what I've been up to uh, over the past month here at Maker Jane. I've got quite a lot to share with you. I've got my notes here that I'm going to be looking at from time to time just to make sure that I stay on track because if I don't follow my notes, uh, we could be here a lot longer than I intend to be. So I may be looking down from time to time, so just keep that in mind. Before we get into all of what I want to share with you, I want to mention that uh, at the very end of this video, I'm going to be sharing with you some vintage finds that I discovered as I was going through some fabric that I had been given by a friend who basically uh, wasn't going to be quilting anymore. And so um, she had a whole big collection of fabric from her mom, who was an avid quilter. She was a crafter and a sewist and a quilter. Uh, so I got like stacks of tubs full of fabric. And in the midst of all that fabric, I also found some really cool vintage things that I want to share with you, but I'm going to save those for the end of this video. So make sure you stay until the end of the video so you can check out all of the fun vintage things that I found. During the month of February, I really had to slow down. Where I grew up and where I've lived before this, uh, we didn't have any seasons. So being in an environment that has seasons, I'm starting to feel it more in my body. And just like the seasons of nature, our own bodies go through these rhythms and go through these cycles. And so I really felt it this year, and especially during the month of February, I really needed to slow down. And so I did. Uh, there were areas of my business that I really had to slow down on because I was actually starting to feel quite overwhelmed. Um, I just started my business and it has been growing exponentially. My YouTube channel has been growing exponentially. Uh, my fans who have joined my email list, my email list has been growing exponentially and I'm starting to make sales in my Etsy shop. And so it's been really exciting and I'm so thankful for all the support that I'm getting here on my channel. Thank you for watching as well as on my Instagram account and my blog and website. So it's been really exciting, but it's also been a little bit overwhelming because there is so much to do when not only are you trying to run a business by yourself, but when you're just getting started with running a business, uh, there's so much to do and it can be quite overwhelming. So during the month of February, I realized that I really needed to slow down. And so that's what I did. I set aside some projects that I had started in January. Uh, for example, the hand embroidery series that I was intending on following along with the entire year. I realized I had to set that aside because for me, that wasn't as much of a priority. Um, uh, you may have seen some of my hand embroidery videos here on the channel and really what I'm doing, what I have been doing is just documenting my hand embroidery experience. I'm learning how to hand embroider and I'll link to some of those videos up here so you can check them out if you'd like to. But um, I wanted to learn how to hand embroider this year. Unfortunately, because of my low energy and high stress levels, I realized I needed to set some things aside. And so the hand embroidery videos was one of those things. And it wasn't just the videos. I actually didn't pick up any hand embroidery at all for the entire month of February. I am intending to pick it back up and I will be making more videos and sharing my experience with learning hand embroidery. So you can look forward to those videos if that's something that you have been enjoying. 
but that was something that I needed to take a break on and I'm glad I did because there were other things that I wanted to focus my energy into and um, to really help my business, Maker Jane, to make some progress and to continue to grow. The motto, the phrase that, um, that kind of initiated that and some other things that I slowed down on was the phrase, easy does it. It, it really was a paradigm shift for me when I realized I was stressing out on some things that really didn't need to be stressed out on. And if I slow down and focus and not put so much pressure on myself, I can actually accomplish more. So easy actually does it or easy accomplishes it. And so I did a little experiment with myself for the month of February to see if that concept really worked. And it did. It does. I feel so much more grounded now. And um, I was able to kind of just step away a little bit from a few things and really gain some renewed focus and gained by resting, gained some energy now to move forward as spring is approaching. So moving on from the hand embroidery that obviously I took a break from. Um, one reason why I wanted to take a break from certain things was because I am still in the process of getting my Color Confidence for Quilters certification. If you've watched last month's uh, or January's update video that I published at the beginning of February, I did mention in that video as well that I have been working on getting certified to teach workshops for quilters on color and how to use color, color science, as well as color intuition. And it's a really super awesome program and I'm really excited to get to teach it in the near future, but I'm still working on my certification in order to do so. So uh, I've got one more exam to do. It, it's a live presentation that I have to do in front of a group of people. And I'm currently working on that. But during the month of February, um, I had my first exam to do. And so I was really focusing in on that and all of the tasks that I needed to focus on to accomplish that. I did pass that exam, which I'm really happy and proud of myself for doing. It was quite nerve wracking. Uh, especially because I'm going to be focusing on teaching workshops online via Zoom. And the technical stuff was a bit of a challenge. So working out the bugs and um, actually being able to practice it in front of real life people, uh, of course, online, um, was, was a little nerve wracking. But I'm happy to say that I did pass that exam and I have one more to go. So that will be next week. I will be doing my last exam and I'm very excited to, uh, to be finishing up the certification because I cannot wait to start teaching it. So if you're interested in learning more about color for quilters, I will put a link down below where you can join my email list. It's basically a waiting list. And as my certification progresses, uh, I will be sending out notifications and updates on my progress, as well as letting my subscribers know when I will begin teaching those workshops. So if you're interested in taking a workshop from me on Color Confidence for Quilters, check out the link below and you can sign up for the waitlist. So there was a few things that I did get accomplished for Maker Jane. I've been working on some pattern designs and some more videos for you, some more project videos. And um, my goal, my goal was to have the video up and published by the end of February. But last week, right at the end of February, uh, we had, <laughs> so my husband and I, we live on a farmstead and we have been raising goats. Now we raise goats primarily for milk as well as for weeding our property. We have uh, a large piece of rural property here and there is a lot of scrub oak as well as pine trees that just have not been managed for many, many years, over 50 years. And so there's a lot of overgrowth, a lot of fire hazard. And so we got the goats to help us manage 
the forest and to help us manage the pasture. Goats are a great way to manage land without using pesticides or chemicals of any kind. So, um, so we're trying to approach, you know, land management using nature friendly methods. So the goats have been such a blessing. And last week, right at the end of February, we ended up having three, we actually had four does that were, uh, with kids, they were pregnant, and three of them decided to uh, all have their kids right within three or four days of each other. Two of them actually was on the same day, and one of them was a couple days before, and we have one more doe that we're expecting to kid here in the next few days. So last week was a bit of a, um, just a challenging week overall. I, I really didn't accomplish anything the last week of February uh, relating to any kind of crafting or sewing or anything relating to Maker Jane. I was solely focused on the goats and I just kind of ended the month with that same mentality of, you know what, I'm gonna take it easy on myself. I'm not gonna stress and we're just gonna go with it. We're just gonna go with the flow and pick, th pick things back up as you know things slow down a little bit with the goats. So all of our kids are very healthy and happy little goats. They are starting to bounce around now and have fun and get into mischief, but uh, we're very blessed and we're very thankful for um, safe births for the does that have had their kids so far. So with that said, <laughs> um, I had an upcoming project that I was planning on sharing here on the channel. And I have actually had a couple of people ask me about it because I mentioned it in uh, earlier videos and I have not quite got it up for you guys yet on the channel. So I did finish the project. Uh, I got most of the video footage done. I just have to film the intro and, you know, basically introducing the video and then I can edit it all together. So I still need to edit the video and then publish it here for you on YouTube. So you can look forward to that, but I did finish the project and it's one of the projects that I mentioned in an earlier video. I was making uh, hexagon fabric out of English paper piecing. So it's the first of the two projects that I was going to share with you on how you can use English paper piece fabric to make different projects. So if you're not yet subscribed, be sure to subscribe so that you can uh, be notified when I publish that video. I'm hoping to have it up in the next week so you can look forward to that. That'll be the next video that I post here on the channel. Another update for Maker Jane is you may not be familiar with my shop, but I do have an Etsy shop and I'll link to that down below in the description as well. I've got some templates available for you there, English paper piecing templates, both pre-cut hexagon templates, as well as printable templates that you can print and cut at home yourself. And I've got several sizes available in the shop. So I updated the shop with some new products a couple weeks ago. And uh, some of those new products include a couple new printable English paper piecing template shapes. So I think I added uh, hexagon printables. And then I think I also added um, jewels as well. So there's a few more shapes available in the shop. And in addition to those, I also added some new needle minders to the shop. And I want to take a minute just to show you some of the new needle minder designs that I added. So if you're not familiar with a needle minder, real quick, it's basically a magnet and it's a notion that you can use not just with English paper piecing, you can use it with any hand stitching project and it helps mind your needle. So because it's a magnet, if you set your needle on the magnet, it will hold your needle for you. If you need to set your work down for some reason and get up and go do something else, you don't have to worry about your needle getting lost in the couch or wherever you may be. Maybe you're in the car working on your hand stitching or even maybe on an airplane. Uh, you don't wanna drop that needle. So it's helpful to have something that has a magnet on it to hold your needle for you. I use needle minders as a double duty because they're also great for English paper piecing when you have pieces that are kind of awkward to hold. 
You can use your needle minder to hold your pieces together while you're stitching as well. And then of course they double as holding your needle while you're, uh, while you're sewing. So I'm gonna pull out one needle minder that I really like, and then I'll show you a few that of the ones that I added recently. So this is my um, packaging that I use for my needle minders. It's basically just a business card. On the back, I've got my information here. So um, anyone who orders a needle minder has got, you know, the ability to contact me for any reason if they need to. But the, um, the needle minder is basically, I'm using vintage buttons. Now, I inherited, I guess you could say, a whole ton of vintage buttons from my mother-in-law as well as from a friend whose mother had collected buttons and a whole bunch of other sewing stuff. She gave me a ton of stuff and there was a collection of buttons in that as well. So I have been looking through all of these buttons over the past several months and picked out the most unique buttons that I received. And what I do is I add a magnet to the back and then there's an additional magnet that I sandwich this card between. So you've got two magnets and they stick together. You put your work in between those two magnets and then this whole thing is magnetic. So I can just set my needle down on it and actually I think I have a needle around here. Here we go. Here we go. So I can just set my needle on the needle miter and it holds the needle. So it's super convenient, especially for English paper piecing. And I use these all the time. So that's what a needle miter is. Let me show you a couple of the ones that I added to the shop. There's a whole bunch. I'm not gonna show you all of them, but just to give you an idea. So this is an example of one that is a covered button. So I just basically took a scrap of fabric, really cool uh, blue and green, aqua green uh, fabric scrap and made a button out of it and then attached the magnet to that. There is a few more. This is another fun one. This is actually a Carolyn Friedlander fabric. So if you like modern fabrics, I've got some modern fabric covered needle minders in the shop. I really like that one. There's also um, some vintage buttons. So I mentioned the vintage buttons. Here's an example of one that I really love. It's a uh, mother of pearl, beautiful vintage button uh, that I, again, I just attached the magnet to the back of that button. So there are several new needle minders in the shop as of last week. So I will, again, link to that down below in the description if you want to check out any of the other needle minders that are in there or any of the English paper piecing templates that I have added as well. Another thing that I worked on uh, during the month of February is I have had several requests here on YouTube from some of my viewers who are ready to move on from hexagons. And I totally get that. <laughs> Um, I have been ready to move on from hexagons for the last few weeks, I would say, and I actually designed a new pattern. It's not quite done yet, but I designed a new design, an EPP design that uses other shapes. There are no hexagons in the pattern, but the shapes actually can make hexagons. So it's still kind of a hexagon theme, but you're not actually using any hexagon templates in the pattern at all. It's still in its very early stages. I've got the pattern designed. Uh, now I need to start making samples and make sure that everything is working together and then actually write the pattern instructions. So it's still a ways off, but you can look forward to seeing a new pattern from me in the future. I've got a few free patterns coming out. I've got one already on the blog and I still need to make a video on that, which I need to remember to do, mental note. But I do have a free English paper piecing pattern and project available on the blog. I've got some coming up here on the YouTube channel that are free as well. And then I'll be adding some to my shop. So uh, I'll let you know here on YouTube when that new pattern is finally released. I don't really have a date yet because it's still in such the early stages 
but I'll let you know. So be sure to subscribe. Now we're going to be moving into some more of the personal stuff that I worked on during the month of February. First of all, I mentioned earlier when I inherited all those buttons, I also inherited a whole bunch of quilting fabric. I had bins and bins and bins of fabric. And when I got the fabric, I really didn't know where the heck I was going to put it. My sewing studio is extremely small and it's basically just a small bedroom. Um, there's not a lot of closet space. I've got a big cutting table in the middle of the room. So there's not a lot of room in here to really store fabric. So I was really not sure how to do that. So during the month of February, I was working on organizing all this fabric. Part of what is going to help me move forward creatively is to be organized. And having fabric all over and not knowing what I had and, you know, what was in it and how old it was, uh, was kind of nerve wracking to say the least, because I like to know what I have so that I can reach for, you know, whatever color I need whenever I need it and move forward with the creative process. Anything that hinders my creative process, uh, slows me down and that's true for any of us. So I, I realized and I knew that I needed to get that fabric organized. So I've got some footage just kind of showing you how I ended up organizing my fabric. It all started in these bins and eventually, slowly but surely, it took me about a month to get it all out of the bins and sorted and figuring out what I had, taking out anything that maybe wasn't quilting cotton, uh, setting that aside and um, getting everything organized by color. So I've got, uh, one shelf that's out in my studio. That's where I store all of my fat quarters, most of my fat quarters. And um, those, the fabric that's on this shelf is all from cotton cuts. Most, most of it's from cotton cuts, but it's all from fabric subscriptions. So it's all uh, more updated fabric. Most of it is, I might've mixed in some older fabrics as well, but most of it is, you know, fabric that was released within the last couple of years. And I've got some traditional style fabric. I've got some modern style fabric. So it's kind of just all mixed together, but it is organized by color. Then for all of the fabric that, that I inherited, which is more yardage, so anything bigger than a fat quarter, um, I put into the closet that's here in the studio. And I wanted to get some Ikea shelves, just like the ones that I have all my garment fabrics stored on, but Ikea was out of shelves. So I ended up, I went to Ikea anyway, and I ended up finding a slightly smaller shelf that I didn't quite fit the way I wanted it to in the closet. So I had to turn one of the shelves on its side and I ended up getting three shelves and stored all of the yardage fabric on those shelves. And it actually turned out pretty good. So I also organized those by color so that when I'm ready to get a color or when I wanna start working on fabric poles, I can just start grabbing from the colors that I want because now it's all organized and I can just go straight into my fabric poles, which is super relieving and just, I just feel so, uh, so good about being organized. So if you need to organize your fabric, I highly encourage you to consider it. And maybe I'll do some videos in the future on how I organize my fabric. If you'd like to see videos like that, leave me a comment down below in the description. Um, I am always open to new ideas on some of the videos that I make for you. And I know that fabric organization is one that we all have to deal with. And, um, I'm always looking at new ways to organize fabric. So yeah, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll do a video on that in the future. So the next personal project that I worked on, I did get something done for myself, which is also very important for us makers uh, who make for a lot of other people. Um, it's important that we make things for ourselves as well. And I mentioned before I do garment sewing. So I have been wanting to make some sweatpants for myself especially since we're still in winter and it's been very cold here lately. So I found a free pattern online 
and they're for like jogger pants, I think is what they're called. I'll link to that pattern down below if you're interested in making yourself some. But I had purchased some sweatpant fabric from Joann's months ago, I think last year sometime, maybe even the year before, I don't remember. I've had it for a while, but I bought it with the intention of using that free pattern to make some sweatpants. So finally, this past February, last month, I finally made some sweatpants. So I'm gonna insert some footage here and just show you what how they turned out, what they look like. There is definitely some changes that I need to make to the pattern. Um, they are a little bit small in the rear, so I want a little bit more room in the rear. And the reason I say that is because when I squat or I bend down, or even when I just sit down, um, the pants tend to pull down, the waistband pulls down. So I think I need to make some alterations in the pattern. That's to be expected because the pattern was free. So, you know, you're not gonna get a perfect pattern, but um, we also all have different bodies. So my body shape is different from the lady that designed the pattern and she probably designed the pattern off of her body shape. So it's to be expected that there are some, you know, some alterations I need to make. But um, certain areas are small, like the rear, and then other areas are big and baggy. Like you might be able to see here, the, the legs, the knees are really baggy. Um, even the backs of the knees are baggy. And then this front area right uh, below my belly is very baggy. There's way too much fabric in the front and not enough fabric in the back. And then the waistband I found is a little bit too loose as well. So um, rather than go down a size, I think I'm gonna stick with the same size that I made. And I think it was a size large is what I chose based on my measurements. So I'm gonna stick with that same size and I'm just gonna make some adjustments on the pattern. But overall, for the first try, I didn't make a mock-up or anything. This is just, this is my mock-up. Um, overall, I'm pretty happy. They're super comfortable. I just want them to fit a little bit better. So I have a second fabric that I'm gonna make a second pair out of, but before I cut the fabric, I'll make my changes to that pattern and go from there. So I'm really happy that I actually made something for myself for the month of February. And that was something, that was another reason why I wanted to slow down on some things. So that hand embroidery I set aside so that I could spend my personal time making something for myself that I've been meaning to make for over a year. So sometimes we need to do that. And I think it's important that we take care of ourselves in these little ways. Another personal project that I was able to accomplish during the month of February was piecing a quilt top together. Now, I don't quite have the blocks all assembled yet, but the individual blocks themselves, I was able to piece together. And if you like this design and you like this pattern, this is also available for free. I found it actually through Man Sewing. It's a YouTube channel here on YouTube. He collaborated with uh, Jenny Doan of Missouri Star Quilt Company. They did a video together uh, called Three Dudes Quilt. I'll put a card to it up here because then you can click and get directly, directly straight to that video. But basically all you need is a jelly roll, basically two and a half inch strips, and you can make this quilt. Uh, it's got two and a half inch strips and then one and a half inch strips. So the black is a separate jelly roll of solids in one and a half inch strips, which I don't think that's called a jelly roll. I think that's called a cinnamon bun or something. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, check out the pattern. It was super fun to put together. I've got it on the design wall because I'm auditioning layouts right now. This is the one, I think I've auditioned three different layouts so far, and this is the one I'm liking the best. So basically what I do is I put the blocks up on the design wall, and then I step back and I take a picture with my iPhone. And then I will do some rearranging and try a different layout. And then I step back again and take another picture. And then that way I can look at the pictures kind of from far away because they're, they're much smaller than like a big wall in front of you. So it's nice to be able to step away and look at your quilt from afar and see an overall pattern or you know color arrangement see how you like it from afar. Um, so that's kind of how I do that. 
but this is a quilt that I am going to be putting together for my nephew. He has a birthday coming up in June, so uh, I'm ahead of schedule, which is good. But um, but yeah, I'm super excited that I got that going in February and hoping to get these blocks pieced this month um, and then continue on with it and ship it off to him for his birthday. So we got two more things. I've got some uh, special vintage finds that I want to show you. I'm saving those for the end of the video. That'll be the next one. But before we get to that, I've got one more to go. There was an English paper piecing workshop last month and it was super fun and I really enjoyed it. Um, I took it for my own personal enjoyment to help me um, learn a new, learn some new English paper piecing skills that maybe I didn't, uh, never had officially learned before. Maybe it kind of, I just, I just taught myself. So it was super fun. Um, the workshop was with Giuseppe Ribaudo. He is also known as Juicy Juice on Instagram. He did a workshop inside of Meander Quilt Guild and I'm a member of Meander Quilt Guild and we meet every month for a regular guild meeting, but there's also workshops every month inside of Meander. And they are live workshops. And then you also have access to all of the past workshops that have ever been offered inside Meander because they're all recorded. So it has uh, been a blast. I've been a member for over a year and I absolutely love it. And I'll put a link down below if you want to check it out and learn more about it. You're welcome to do that. But it's fun because you can get together with other quilters. They, they even have a... Um, they actually have two a month, two sit and sews. It's just, you just get online, it's through Zoom, and you hang out with other quilters from all over the world and you just sit and stitch and chat and drink tea and have fun and, you know, connect with other like-minded makers. So I love Meander and I loved the workshop. The workshop that Giuseppe taught in February was how to choose fabrics for English paper piecing. And I have never really taken a class on that. I just kind of choose fabrics based on what I think looks good. But um, sometimes I make projects and I realize after the fact that it doesn't look as good as I wanted it to. So it was really cool to be able to um, get Giuseppe's uh, tips and, um, you know, learn about fabrics from an English paper piecing perspective. There are so many different types of fabrics. There's so many different prints and um, some are, you know, more conducive to English paper piecing and some probably can't really be used for English paper piecing very well. For example, a fabric that has a really large print, it's going to be hard to get a consistent look from that fabric if your pieces are smaller than what that print motif is. So yeah, so I just picked up some tips from the workshop. And again, you can check out the recording of the workshop if you're interested, links down below for Meander. There is another workshop coming up in March. Uh, actually, no, it was last week. <laughs> it was in March, but um, that was also recorded. So you can see that one too. And that workshop was on how to sew curves with your English paper piecing. And I had intention to be on the live workshop, but I wasn't able to attend live because our goats were kidding. So uh, I'm going to be watching that later this week. I'm going to go in and watch the recording of that. But I've got the pattern. He, gave, he provided a pattern for that workshop. So I've got the pattern all cut out. All my templates are ready. I've got all my fabric selected. Uh, so now I just need to actually watch the workshop and follow along and put the pattern together. So yeah, so there's the fabric and the Curves Workshop, both by Giuseppe. And I think it was either last year or the year before, he did another workshop on just the basics of English paper piecing. So there's actually a whole series of English paper piecing workshops inside of Meander. So if you're interested in checking those out, again, links down below. All right, so finally, I want to show you these vintage quilt blocks and other vintage finds that I found in the collection of fabric that I inherited or that I was given from this friend of mine. 
And again, I got stacks and stacks and stacks of tubs of fabric. I had no idea what was in these tubs. So as I went through them during the month of February, as I was organizing all that fabric, I came across some really, really cool finds. This first piece is a beautiful machine embroider with some cut work design into it as well. And this piece of fabric was must have been cut from another larger piece. It's got raw edges all around it. I could see myself using this as maybe the centerpiece of a quilt block and maybe uh, overlaying it on top of another fabric of some sort. This piece here is another scrap piece of fabric and I really like the embroidery that's on it. This looks more of a hand embroidery design. And I don't know what I would do with the embroidery section, but I, I really like it. So I may incorporate that into a project in the future. I also really like the fringe here at the bottom. It is crocheted and it's not a very long section, but it could be used on a small project, maybe a little sewing case or uh, something of that nature maybe a mini pillow or even like a pin cushion or something like that. Here's another section of scrap fabric that has this lovely detail along the bottom. This is a much longer piece, so it could potentially be used for a larger project. And I actually found more than one section. And again, this is a crocheted, and I don't know if that's hand crocheted or maybe machine crocheted, but it's just a really beautiful design. It's fairly clean. There isn't any tears or uh, areas of it that wouldn't be usable. And it would be great for something to add a little bit of a detail around maybe a pillow or other type of quilty project. Here's another piece of fabric that I found, and this one is actually finished on all, all the edges. So I really love the lace on this. I have no idea how I want to use it. I think it might have come from a little mini curtain section or something. I'm not quite sure. But you can see here at the top and on the sides, it's got a finished edge. So it may have been sold like that, or perhaps the person that collected this finished the edges. I don't know but this lace is absolutely beautiful. I have no idea how I'm gonna use it or if I will ever end up using it. I just love it. And it looks like the turquoise section of the fabric is a linen fabric. So now we're going to get into some of the quilt blocks that I found in that giant collection of fabric. These blocks came in this little bag and it looks as though they were sold this way because the bag, that label on the bag, actually corresponds to what's, what was in the bag when I found it. So we have these little hexagon flowers, and I'll zoom in here so you can actually get a closer look. But this fabric is definitely vintage fabric. I would estimate that it's probably from maybe the 30s or 40s. That's at least the style of fabric that was used. I don't know if that was actually when it was made, but this fabric definitely comes from that era. And each one of these hexagon flowers has been hand stitched. And you can see that no papers were used. So this was not necessarily English paper pieced. This was just hand pieced. And I have never done that before, but my understanding of how one might do that is that they would trace the seam allowance on the actual fabric on the wrong side of the fabric. And that's how one would know where to put the stitches. Whereas with English paper piecing, the paper template that's inside of the pieces, that is really how we determine how to stitch or where to stitch our English paper piecing. But I really love these fabrics. I want to use these blocks in something somehow. I have no idea how I will use them. Obviously, the edges need to be finished because they're not folded under as they would be with English paper piecing. But each block is unique, and I absolutely love the fabric. So if anything, it actually is inspiring me to 
open my horizons in terms of the type of fabric that I might use for my future quilt projects. I typically am drawn to batik fabrics, but these beautiful vintage fabrics are really attracting me and I really like how this one was fussy cut. So I'm gonna lay them out all here so you can kind of see them all together from a little bit farther away. And there is a total of eight of these hexagon flowers. Each one totally unique. Some of them use a couple of fabrics that are the same, but overall, very unique pieces. I'm very happy with this find. This next vintage find was definitely a treat as well. And you're going to see why here in just a second. I'm just pulling it all out of the bag. And that's exactly how I found it. Everything was wrapped nicely and folded nicely in the bag. And when I first started pulling things out, I thought, okay, th this, is a, this is a kit. And I just saw scraps of fabric, but I noticed, you know, those pencil lines of the shapes on the back. So I was very curious about what I was going to find inside as I continued to unfold and open things up. There were some pieces that were already cut out and pretty much ready to stitch. So that's what those are here. And as I was going through the fabric, I wasn't sure what, what it was all for. So I just pulled each piece out. There's a few more triangles here. Then we start getting into these bigger sections. Some of these pieces of fabric had the seam line drawn on them like this one. And other sections of the scrap fabric didn't have anything drawn on them. So I wasn't quite sure what they were for, but like that piece, I don't think has any lines on it. And then I come to this work in progress. And this is just special to me because the pins are still in it and the quilter was about ready to start stitching them together. And I think that's so special when you know that someone else's hands had held that piece and were getting ready to stitch it together. This is what I discovered after I went through all the scraps. So this is the first block set that I found in the package. And I'm just going to move this stuff out of the way real quick so that I've got a little bit more room on the table to show you what else is in that bag? So we had those two blocks and then I opened up the rest of the piece and this is what I discovered. It is still a work in progress. It's not finished yet, but we've got several of those star blocks and this beautiful applique section in the middle. So here I am just kind of simulating what this would look like if it were finished. So I grabbed those two blocks that I had found in the package, placing them where they would go. And then I wanted to go through the rest of the scraps to try to recreate these corner blocks that you can see in the upper left and upper right corners. So I'm just kind of looking through the rest of the fabric to see if I would even have enough of it to finish this project. And it looks like this block or these pieces would form a block here in the left corner on the bottom. And this brown triangle would fit there. So I could create one more block, but the remaining block on the bottom right, I am missing some fabrics. The fabrics that I'm missing would be the pink square and then the larger brown triangle. 
So that's not a big deal. I could pull some pink fabric out of my stash. Uh, I've got a ton of brown fabric that I could slip in there as well. And of course that last block wouldn't necessarily match the rest of this project, but that kind of adds to the nostalgia of the vintage quality of the project. So I think this is something that I am definitely going to finish. And I really love this beautiful applique center. I have done a little bit of exploration of hand applique and it's something that I really enjoy and I wanna do a lot more of. So I'm looking forward to, to doing that. And I just wanna show you this detail here of these blocks. This entire project has been hand pieced. And you can see that by the types of stitches that you see here. The blocks themselves have been hand pieced. The applique has been hand appliqued. And there's the detail of that. So you can see the hand stitches. So I am looking forward to finishing this in whatever free time I can find in the near future. I'd like to work on it sometime this year and have it done by the end of the year. I think that would be a realistic goal to set. So this next vintage treasure is quite a treasure. It looks to me like this is a section out of an existing quilt. And it definitely has some areas that are worn and torn and uh, are not really that fixable. That one piece of fabric, that one triangle that I pointed at is pretty shredded. So I don't think there's any way to really fix this. But it's just nice to have a piece of history. And this is basically a block that has been cut out of a larger quilt, a larger vintage quilt. And I'm assuming that the person who collected this probably purchased this quilt block or maybe was given this quilt block. Uh, but because it's been cut out of a quilt, it seems to me like it would be something that someone might purchase from a shop. And it is entirely hand quilted. And you can tell by the, the way the quilting is. Here's another one that is another quilt block. Again, has been hand cut out of a vintage quilt. This is the back, and then there's the edges. You can see how it was cut out. And it looks like this was also hand quilted. I really love this design. And it's inspiring me to want to start sewing curves. So I'm excited about the English paper piecing workshop that I will be getting to work on soon. But I also want to explore curves with machine piecing as well. So you can see the hand stitching here, the hand quilting. I love this design. I love how using only two different fabrics uh, with a design like this, it still has a lot of interest in it. And your eye is drawn to move across the quilt, even though you're only using two fabrics. You can see here there's a few stains, but that's to be expected with something that is this old. Here's a nice detail of the hand quilting. That's something that I want to try as well this year. Let me know in the comments, have you ever done any hand quilting or do you typically do machine quilting? So these next set of blocks are also very beautiful and very enjoyable to look at. They each are very unique using little tiny stamp size squares of these floral fabrics intermingled with this bright yellow fabric and then of course the white blocks in between. Here's a close up showing a little bit more detail on those fabrics. There's some really beautiful fabric scraps in here. Again, all vintage fabrics. And these blocks are all hand pieced as well. You can actually see here the difference between 
some machine piecing, which was used to actually put the two blocks together, and the hand piecing that's right next to it. So you can see the difference in the, the way the stitch looks. And you can tell which is which pretty clearly. Here's a look at it from the other side, and you can see it clearly here too. It looks like the tension was off a little bit on that machine stitching. So here's a couple more blocks from this collection, and I just wanted to show you that the blocks, once they're stitched together, they don't actually line up at the same size. So you can see here the side seams are way off on the, just these two blocks. And there's a whole stack of blocks here. So I'm not quite sure how I'm going to incorporate these into a workable project, but they would definitely make almost an entire quilt. And these are the last set of blocks that I found in this beautiful collection of vintage finds. There are several different blocks here, and I'm just going to speed up the camera and show you all the different styles of blocks real quick. I really love the color scheme of the color combinations and fabric combinations used. And I love the different variety of blocks as well. And there, again, there's enough blocks here that I could probably make an entire quilt out of this. So I will probably piece these together at some point this year as well. So here's all of the vintage finds that I discovered together on the table so you can see it all together. I was very surprised and very pleased with these finds. All right, that's it for the update video. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully something in here inspired you to um, get a little creative or maybe get outside your comfort zone or maybe try something new or go explore something that you never thought of before. I'd love to hear from you down below in the comments. If you do enjoy them, let me know. What was your favorite part of this update video for February 2022? Remember to check the description below for any links that you were interested in checking out that I mentioned throughout this video. And give it a thumbs up if you like this video. It will help me get seen more on YouTube and grow my channel, and it will help other quilters find me as well. Thanks for watching, and until next time, keep on stitching.